not to sound mean on SRAM, I do love a lot of what SRAM uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> do do and have pioneered, but uh, chains, the chains do tend to be not the fastest. This is part two of my series on drivetrain efficiency with Adam Karen of Zero Friction Cycling. In part one, we discuss bicycle chain lubricant, and while an entire video talking about chain lube doesn't seem incredibly fascinating at first, the lube that you use actually has the biggest impact on your drivetrain's efficiency and can save you a handful of watts. That being said, the other components of your drivetrain have an effect on its efficiency as well. For example, we get into the chain itself and which chain manufacturers produce the most efficient and least efficient chains. And yes, we will be explicitly naming these companies in this video. I just hope we have a good lawyer, man, because uh, SRAM is not going to be happy about this one. We also discuss the other components of the drivetrain, such as chain rings, cogs, bearings, etc. Yes, all of these components have an effect on the drivetrain's efficiency, and Adam gave some very nuanced answers here that I found fascinating. Let's get into it. But moving on from chain lube, let's talk about the actual chain itself. And are there chains that are faster than other chains, or are all chains kind of the same efficiency? Yeah, no, that's a great one. That's been a fun little area as well. So absolutely, there's quite a, a big difference between uh, chains. So it can be between sort of mostly between chain brands as opposed to uh, chain models as such. For instance, at the, at the fastest end, we've got chains like a Shimano Durace 11 speed, uh, the new Campy 12 speed there, kind of the fastest chains tested. So now I don't do outright efficiency testing. So for chain efficiency, I rely on Ceramic Speed, um, the Denmark research lab there. So they test chains so that they know what chains to use for their UFO chains. And it took me a long time, so I always had the data, but it took me a long time to convince them to allow me to make that data public because obviously they didn't want to upset manufacturers. So only about midway through last year, uh, they allowed me to actually publish um, sort of broadly the, the test data that they have on chains. So typically, um, and not to sound mean on SRAM, I do love a lot of what SRAM uh, mm -hmm. do do and have pioneered, but uh, chains, the chains do tend to be not the fastest, can tend to be super long lasting, but just not that fast compared to the ones at the top end. So like for instance, your access road chains typically will be around sort of the five and a half watt um, mark uh, as opposed to a three watt mark. So you're sort of giving up a couple of, you know, sort of two and a half watts there. So it's a fair bit uh, in just in chains. And correct me if I'm wrong, but th some of the higher end SRAM chains are actually even worse than the lower end SRAM chains. And, and the newer, mm. the newer flat top chains seem to be worse. Uh, am I wrong about that? Or is that correct? The flat top chains, I guess I'd say are similar to their, um, uh, previous sort of the, like your red 22 or your 11 speed xx1 they're just not fast so they're still sort of staying around that sort of five and a half six watt mark eagles are a bit slower again so the eagle chains are again super long lasting just not fast but yeah with sram so typically low friction coatings are put on more components inside the chain the higher level the chain you go so for instance with Shimano, a Durace chain is going to be faster than an Altegra because it has that Siltec low friction coating on more parts. Um, SRAM, it has been a little bit confusing. So for instance, yeah, their force level chain for Axis Road is faster than their red level by half a watt. And their uh, X01 Eagle chain is half a watt faster than their XX1 chain. And we don't really have an explanation as to, as to why. We've got some sort of guesses, but we don't really know why. Um, and it is, that's really the, the only case we've seen where the top level is not sort of faster than the next level down. And so, yeah, so if you look at, say, ceramic speed, the UFO chains are force level, not red level. I don't want to pick on SRAM too much. There's a lot of things that SRAM is doing that I like. Uh, I like the fact that their electronic shifting is wireless, for example. I, I have Shimano on my road bikes and my gravel bikes, but I actually have SRAM on my mountain bikes. I don't use a SRAM chain, but for somebody who's got a SRAM drivetrain, do you have a recommendation as to what chain they can run? Yeah, absolutely. So... Eagle off-road, that's pretty easy. So uh, the YBN 12-speed chain is a great go-fast option for the Eagle. That works absolutely beautifully on Eagle. So like I train on XX1 chains, or so you run an XX1 or X01 chain if you're on Eagle for training because they are so incredibly wear durable. There's nothing remotely like them in terms of wear resistance. And then you run something like a YBN 
for your race chain. When it comes to Axis Road, that is more tricky. So Axis Road is a new standard. They are thinner, both internally and externally versus all other 12 speed chains. And they have oversized rollers. So obviously the cassette profile and chain ring profile is, is made to, um, I guess, run that larger roller size. So we do have, so both YBN and KMC do claim that their 12 speed chains are compatible with all 12 speed systems, including Access Road. Uh, I'm really hesitant personally though to recommend that people do that. I mean, try, you can definitely try it, um, just be careful. Because my fear, aside from the fact that your tuning needs to be extremely precise because the chain is wider, um, my fear is that you know the cassette and the chain rings when you're running a chain with normal size rollers, not oversized rollers, to the drivetrain, it is going to be like you're running a new chain on really worn components. And then you find that it's jumping under load either in a lot of cogs or worst case, it's going to jump off the chain ring under stand-up power, especially in like a stand-up sprint. Yeah, definitely try if you wish, but just be careful. Don't go mm -hmm. over the handlebars, please. Um, have a hot date with the asphalt. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so chains are obviously probably the biggest factor in reducing friction in your drivetrain but let's talk about other aspects of drivetrain efficiency things like a one by versus two by um you know small cogs versus large cogs ceramic bearings how much do these other factors play into the efficiency of the drivetrain before we sort of delve into those it, it's kind of really important i guess to understand that the faster your chain is the less of the penalty you have, you are going to have for things like cross chaining um, or smaller rings and cogs. The slower your chain is, the greater the penalty you're going to have. So, if you've got, for instance, um, just a whatever meh drip lube from you've just that's whatever was on the shelf at the bike store, and it's become a bit contaminated, and you're running a 10 watt chain, when you cross chain that, then you've got a lubricant that's quite gritty and abrasive and, and high loss. So you're going to pay a pretty big penalty for that. If you've got a three to four watt beautiful wax chain, your penalty is very low. Again, just focusing on your you know, chain efficiency is going to give you some pretty big wins. Um, smaller rings and cogs, it's a, like, it depends on what you're talking about. Like if you're talking about road and time trial, obviously generally you want the biggest sort of ring and cog set up. So again, not to pick on SRAM, but then move to smaller rings and the 10 tooth cog for road uh, from an efficiency perspective we strongly disagree with and I hope that one day SRAM will sort of move away from that um, and just even make their sort of 5438 ring option not so horrendously expensive for everyone to try to get onto. Yeah, personally, I'd like to see manufacturers go in the opposite direction, bigger yes. cogs and bigger chain rings. Yes. So, I mean, you see it more focused on in like time trials where obviously they're running mm -hmm. really big rings a good example is i guess more back in the early days when we were sort of 11 speed you know tony martin he would often run an 1132 cassette uh and like a 60 tooth chain ring and it's not because he needs the 60 11 cog you know because it's just so tall what he wants is to be able to hang on to that big ring really well for the gear ratios that he's going to need on a particular course the aim is obviously to have a fairly straight chain line say 80 percent of the time um you know for the bulk of the time and so the cross chain is going to be a lot less and the wider range cassette will often shift the cogs that you need and where this comes into play not only to save the time trials but even if you're on a say a one by setup and you've got an event that is going to have a lot of climbing and really hard climbing so stereotypically your larger rings are going to be you know more efficient than a smaller ring because you've got less articulation at the ring you're going to be running a larger cog for a given gear inches so you've got less articulation at the rear and because there's less leverage of the crank arm over the stop point which is the chain on the chain ring there's less chain tension in a larger ring for the same power if you're doing 250 watts um, at 100 cadence or 90 cadence in a 50 tooth chain ring versus say a mountain bike 32 tooth chain ring um, same power same cadence there's going to be more tension or load on the chain in the smaller chain ring for that same power because of the leverage of the crank arm over the chain. So you've got, you know, on a larger ring, you've got lesser articulation at both ends and it's under lesser tension. So you've got kind of three things all adding up to give you lower losses versus a smaller chain ring, which again is why they're running the biggest they can in time trial stuff. However, if it's say a off-road event and you're going to be doing a lot of climbing, so in theory, it's like, cool, 
do I, I want to run a 34 because I want to run this nice big chain ring and I can get away with that okay because I've got a 50 or a 52 tooth cog that I can I can you know get up that hill okay but I'm going to do a lot of climbing in that combination you've got to remember that the larger you go on the front and the larger you go on the rear that makes your chain line more and more extreme you can imagine if you had say like an 80 tooth ring and an 80 tooth cog your chain line is going to be damn near 45 degrees so the larger you're going at each end you are making your chain line more extreme which is going to give you greater penalty and greater losses for you know running that combination so running maximum cross chaining so it may be that you're going to be better off running say a 30 tooth chain ring which may enable you then to you know remain much more time in your second largest cog as opposed to your largest cog you're going to have overall lower losses by running that combination as opposed to running a more extreme cross chain for a lot of the time so for instance running a 30 to a 42 you know if you're doing an hour or two of climbing in a in a you know massive event like say leadville that's going to quite likely work out much better than pushing it to the extreme and running like a 34 52 so most times larger is going to be lower friction but there may be cases where going smaller um, and having a lesser extreme chain line is going to actually work out in your favor interesting okay and and uh, thoughts on ceramic bearings? That was the last component of that question. Yeah, so I mean, it's one of these things where uh, cheap ceramic bearings are going to be definitely worse than high quality steel. Um, high quality ceramic bearings, you know, yes, they're they're clearly going to be an upgrade. This is where you have got to kind of tend to think of your bike really as a like a race machine. So your faster ceramic bearings typically are going to be faster, not only by being you know sort of a high quality ceramic, but they will have a lighter you know, faster grease with a lower fill level and typically very light or no contact seals. So they do need more care and maintenance in general than your sort of OEM, say Enduro ABEC 5 or ABEC 3 bearing. So faster, yes, but you need to maintain them. A lot of ceramic bearings, if you don't maintain them, so that lighter, faster grease will wear down more quickly. Um, and when the grease also when it wears down past a certain point so the grease behind the seal lip forms what's called a hydrodynamic barrier behind that seal lip and that is actually a large part of the protection of stuff getting inside your bearing once it gets to a point where that barrier is no longer there stuff gets in super easy especially on a, on a wet ride it will just it'll just go straight in so just take note that for almost all faster ceramic bearing upgrades you do need to maintain them and if you don't if you let the lubrication level become quite low quite often basically the, the ceramic balls will become almost like carbide cutters to the metal race of the bearing so you can destroy the metal races quite quickly and this is where your really high quality stuff where they have very very hardened races they will stand up to punishment much much greater than your cheaper stuff that just has sort of your more stock standard um you know steel races so um yeah so yes but with with some caution and so if somebody's weighing out you know the cost and the maintenance and all of this uh you've given out some figures on how many watt savings certain lubricants and chains are what what kind of watt savings are we talking about by doing bottom bracket upgrade for example yeah, generally not that much. So it can it can depend. So some bottom brackets, OEM bottom brackets, can be fairly draggy, um, but they're draggy not because the bearings are necessarily super slow. It's just because they've got um, you know like double lip high you know high uh, contact seals, and they're packed full of a longer lasting grease. So an example would be like for instance a Durace bottom bracket. They're really sort of made by Shimano to give somebody twenty thousand or thirty thousand kilometers of you know road kilometers of service-free trouble-free riding but you're paying for that in drag it's a bit like this is a passenger car bearing that's designed to go 300,000 kilometers in a passenger car trouble-free as opposed to a bearing that you're going to have on your race car that's going to get a lot more attention and be much lower friction so you can save say half a watt straight up by going to a bearing upgrade um, and a lot of that is going to literally be because they have a light or no contact seal and fast grease um, but the cost of that is maintenance. So, but most bottom brackets, if you're, you're like a slow bottom bracket is going to be somewhere around a watt-ish and a fast bottom bracket is going to be somewhere around the 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 watt mark. So you could sort of call it half a watt to a watt max that you would save if you took a sort of worst case bottom bracket scenario and this is sort of talking new versus a fast. Things can obviously be more if the bottom bracket is not performing well. If your bottom bracket sort of gone to crap, then uh, yeah, you've got more to have on there. Um, 
carries on. So wheel bearings, it's similar. Like there's, if you set on average, there's going to be about a half a watt max saving per bearing by going from stock OEM, you know, ABEC 3 steel to a high quality ceramic, then you can carry that across most of, of the range across your bike. Um, caveats to that are pulley wheels tend to be, although yes, you can get to see a pulley wheel on YouTube that spins forever versus an OEM that's going to not spin at all. Just remember that it's such a light, you know, object that the, there's typically in the bearings on a pulley wheel, there's not much savings there. In the bearings, you're talking probably 0.1 of a watt difference between a fast bearing and an OEM. So most of the savings will be in um, uh, like your oversized pulley wheel systems, which are a bit more expensive. I like them, but, and the, I guess the maths and physics do back that, yes, they will save you some watts. Basically, all of the savings are really coming from the lesser articulation around the um, pulley wheels, as opposed to the faster bearings. So yes, the faster bearings help, but again, you're only saving like about 0.1 of a watt in the, in the pulley bearings. Um, but this is one of these areas where, again, your, I guess the marketing for a lot of oversized pulley wheel systems often claim that there's like two, two and two, two and a half watts savings. That's really going to depend on, you know, what chain did they test that on? If you've got a four watt or three watt wax chain, you are not going to save two and a half watts of that in your oversized pulley wheel system. Similar thing where if you've got a really fast chain, your penalty for things like cross chaining and so on are less. The savings for something like an oversized pulley wheel system on a really fast chain are going to be lesser as well. I like them mostly because it's a fun bling upgrade that still saves you something. So uh, anytime I can put something cool uh, on my bike that is still an actual performance benefit, I tend to try to go for it, but it, it depends on your budget. So. Thanks for watching. I left the link to Zero Friction Cycling down in the description below if you want to check it out. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe, and share it with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.